All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Wendy Walker. I am the Community Engagement Manager at Seattle Audubon Society, and I am here with Chris Anderson from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we're going to talk a little bit today about salmonella and uh, an eruption that's been happening with pine siskins in the Pacific Northwest region. So Chris, I'll invite you to come ahead and join us on the camera view and we'll get started. Hi, thank you, Wendy. Yes, uh, my name is Chris Anderson. I'm with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, the district wildlife biologist for the greater King County area. I always joke that I'm uh, the concrete bio for the state. So in any case, uh, uh, I hope everybody's doing well on our Tuesday at lunchtime here. Uh, and, you know, as we get into 2021, after a real hard 2020, let's talk about some birds. So I'm here to talk about uh, salmonella, today and salmonellosis, which is the disease that uh, we get when we uh, have too much salmonella in us and it starts doing naughty things. Uh, and um, yeah, I have a few slides to go through. I don't know if we want to go right into that, Wendy, or? Sure. Why don't we, let's take a look at what you got. All right. I'll do this sharing thing here. Let me see. That should be it. <laughs> I hope, can you see that? Yes. Fantastic. All right. So let's see here. All right, well, hopefully you can see that all on your screen. I can't see what it looks like from mine other than what it is on my end of it. But uh, so here we have one of our common winter birds, a little golden crown kinglet. And I wanna thank Mike Hamilton, who uh, uh, is uh, ever the patient photographer of birds uh, in the greater King County area for sharing this picture. Um, it's just fantastic. I wish I could take a picture like that, but um, I want to thank Seattle Audubon for uh, hosting us and uh, for our partnerships in the past, present, and future. And I want to uh, get into this. So what is salmonellosis? Here we have a little puffed up, half eyes open, half eyes closed. It depends on what you're, you're thinking uh, there. A um, little pine siskin uh, that uh, has salmonellosis, which is uh, what we call a salmonella, a really bad salmonella infection uh, that's causing a whole lot of problems inside their guts and, and um, can cause plaques and other nasty things. And they don't really recover well from a very low rate of them getting better. So, um, so in any case here, I got to move my little screen with all the people. Uh, so what is salmonella and what is, how do, how do these birds get salmonellosis? Um, so again, it's, it's one of our most widespread diseases. Uh, there's over 2,000 different types of salmonella, the bacteria that can cause salmonellosis. There's one, one in particular that tends to be the perpetrator or the <laughs> affecting entity uh, of our songbirds. Uh, we don't know what's in our songbirds really currently. It can be a number of these, uh, but there is one in particular that seems to be associated with songbirds and also particularly some of these like winter finches like siskin, which can is what helps create that issue we see periodically here in, in winter winter birds. So um, it's fed in uh, you know, bacteria uh, in, their, in their system and all of us, you know, we can have a little salmonella in us. It's those that they get out of whack or have a higher load. Um, they poop on something, defecate, and that gets into, in this case, bird seed or on surfaces that you or I or kid may touch um, if we're not wearing rubber gloves and then we go to eat something um, just like for salmon salmonella outbreaks with our food system that's how we get it it, it gets out in a contaminated uh, environment in food or water or other items and we either ingest that directly or get it on us and then ingest it or get it in us um, there's also it can sometimes be um, you know people can get it through respiratory, uh, but that doesn't happen much. So from my understanding, not being a salmon, salmonellosis expert, but that's what I read. So, uh, so a, basically you're looking at when things get dirty, whether it be your food, water, or surfaces that you regular hang on. So um, it's transmitted uh, while well, I went through that. And, and yeah, the illness is salmonella, so salmonellosis. So what's going on here in Washington? Um, so, all of our songbirds can get this, mammals can get it. Uh, it it's typical in, in reptiles, captive reptiles. People are always warned about, you know, potential salmonella load because it's just kind of on them. Um, but here we're dealing with just birds. 
the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, this is what we've seen over the past three years in the winters, uh, midwinter here, kind of December, January. And you can see the little green marks here are last winter. There's about four of them. Uh, this is for December and January. Uh, the gray marks, which are a little hard to see, but those, there's like three of them. And then we have this year. So, you know, plenty, tenfold more, you know, uh, as far as just observations coming in, whether there's salmonella confirm salmonellosis confirmed or not, we can't say. Um, we aren't that superhuman, but we definitely have trends that we're seeing that we tend to see this when this happens in the past as well. So um, some people have asked, well, how was it before, you know, uh, we put out uh, an announcement? Well, the yellow here is pre-announcement when the state put out their January 8th announcement saying, hey, please consider taking down feeders, clean them, etc." And then the purple is post. So people are already reporting this in pretty good numbers. And again, if you look, think of the last slide where we only had a handful or so in the last two years, we already had a lot of people reporting this. COVID-19, all of us at home aside, I like to think personally that, um, that just us at home weren't deride, dr driving entirely this heavy reporting prior to an announcement, but I can't say for certain. So uh, what happens is, um, you know, with uh, these birds getting sick, you know, they go, they, they come into contact with contaminated food, they come in contact with contaminated water at a, at a bath, you know, a bird bath, uh, or just in spaces around the area that maybe are unkempt and there's a lot of fecal matter, um, you know, or uh, seed, uh, even birds getting into like backyard chicken places where it's dirty and they can poop there and the, and the chickens poop there. I mean, that, that can foster salmonella in the environment. Um, but the problem is that these birds, you know, they don't stay just at our feeder. They go to our neighbor's feeders and their other neighbor's feeders. And then some of these species, which I'll get to, are much more far ranging so and unpredictable and they can move quite a bit. And that's where our real concern came in uh, and ties into other regional uh, entities that have called for the same measures. Uh, folks up in British Columbia, Idaho Panhandle, Oregon, California, they're all seeing this. So we have uh, a bit of an outbreak of this happening. Um, and there might be some things that are helping drive it. Um, as far as from an observational sense, we one can't say for sure. Okay, right. Chris, Chris, yeah. and you, Chris, since you mentioned poultry, though, we had a question in the chat on Facebook about um, uh, precautions that backyard poultry feeders can take at this time. Is there anything that you know of or resources that um, uh, domestic bird breeders can think about right now? Yeah, you know, I think I think the best thing if you're really concerned is to talk to Washington State Department of Ag. Uh, also talk to your local extension, uh, WSU extension agent. Um, you know, our, our, our area, our, our wheelhouse is not domestic chickens, but um, you know, this, this is a disease that definitely can be transmitted uh, between other bird species, including domestic chickens and domestic pets as well. I'll get into that, but, and, and we have had an anatolic report of a chicken pecking a, a pine siskin and then perished later um, here this year, but we can't say for certain whether that was salmonella or not, but it goes along with the body of observed evidence. Uh, but yes, it's well established that chickens can come down with uh, various strains of salmonella, salmonella um, and, and exhibiting salmonellosis, uh, just like we're seeing in our songbirds as well. So keeping the place all clean, um, trying to keep your uh, chickens uh, away from any wild bird areas, uh, wild bird feeding sites, um, you know, and, and taking those down for a while, which we get getting ahead of myself here, but um, taking those concentrated wild bird feeding sites down so those birds go back to their normal patterns and foraging activity, uh, help clear any salmonella heavier loads that are in some birds in the area out, or, or unfortunately some of them just perish as well, which will help clear. And, uh, and then we can go back to enjoying some of our uh, backyard, you know, bird feeding activities uh, as things start to subside. Great. Uh, good question about chickens. So another thing we've been seeing, so the big thing here is, you know, we've got um, a bacteria pretty easily spread amongst um, various animals. In this case, we're talking about wild birds. Um, has to be spread by fecal to oral uh, or contact to surface that has that fecal matter contamination on it to then oral or mucosal membrane. 
Uh, we also have a pine siskin eruption, a winter finch eruption, particularly pine siskins this year throughout the lower uh, 48. And in Washington, um, just looking at some observational data, here's eBird for um, last winter, December, January, 2019, much less purple, much less dark purple. Again, I admit COVID-19, <laughs> uh, if you see the frequency down here, we're much more on this scale, not in that scale. We're getting a lot darker here, December and January here. And then um, if you, uh, and also the expanses, and granted this is also based on reporting and whatnot, but so, but it, Taken together, I mean, I think it paints a picture. Here's last year, people see in Siskin. Here's this year, it's pretty much the all the lower 48, darker in areas than over in here. Um, so we we have a species. The thing about these guys is that uh, they're resident here in Washington. We have pine Siskin all the time. What people feel might be happening, and we can't ask the Siskins, but since we have all these animals coming down from up north particularly out east. And then we think there's probably, it's plausible that we have some animals that would not normally be in Washington down here as well because of poor conditions farther to the north and farther to the east in cone crops, that we could have some more um, erratic patterns of siskin, more, more siskins in the area than we normally would, which, you know, you got an animal that likes to move around a lot, you like an animal that's flocking, um, that's the concern there is that's just an extra catalyst for spreading this. And then on top of that, there's been some, in some of the research and papers um, in looking at all the salmonella, salmonella sal salmonellosis in birds, et cetera, some of these winter finches, Siskin being named one of them, uh, there's some, some of the researchers, vet researchers whatnot that suspect, you know, they may be a bit of a reservoir for uh, salmonella. Uh, just naturally, and it's endemic in, in, in them, and they always have a bit of a uh, higher load um, from readings and whatnot. Not a salmonella expert, uh, not a siskin expert either, but it kind of makes sense. I mean, this is these are things that they've been speculating about this since 80s, 90s, you know, as far as are they a reservoir or not, and to my knowledge, no one's landed the plane, but they found out more that these guys, they can move north, south, East, West, any given time of the year, uh, they, they blow all over the place. They can be moving all around Puget Sound or maybe they're moving around Oregon and Washington too. Um, you know, I can't say for certain, uh, but uh, that's the overarching uh, understanding need more research out there with uh, these guys. And we definitely have a lot of them in the state of Washington and in lower 48 right now. So, so again, they're flocking birds. Um, so they're a good example of just having birds come together, but also having species that tend to uh, have an affinity with each other. Um, and here again, we have siskins, a uh, little finch that uh, they love to be together. They're all hanging out this feeder with uh, niger or thistle seed. Um, they're over, over each other, hanging out, um, looking like they're having fun, but that's like a kindergarten and here's the sick kid. So uh, they start feeding, visiting other feeders that other birds come to. They much easily can uh, defecate in a platform feeder versus that last tube feeder. However, the tube feeders can be issues too because uh, they poop on each other and poop on it. And um, so uh, as, as they start moving around, running into other animals uh, as well, uh, they start looking, some of them you start noticing this half, half eyes open, uh, kind of you know listing, puffed up, not moving. You can almost walk up to them. Sometimes you can and just just take them. Um, this bird's pretty much gone, for example. So we can also get other animals coming through once we get these sick birds and taking advantage not only of the fact that they can hit our backyard birds, which you know is part of the you know uh, wild America we have in our backyard, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, but uh, it's well known that raptors, if they hit, eat uh, birds that have uh, a high salmonella load or have salmonellosis outright, uh, that they can also get sick. And, uh, and then they can carry it and spread it or they can perish. And so it's just, we have a situation where we can start to have a lot of different species that could start getting this and spreading it. Maybe not as widespread as like some of our really wide, wide ranging roaming birds like pine siskin, uh, but you see the siskins going out like this potentially, and then you have you know your little robins and your local cooper's hawk, and they're kind of spreading around your neighborhood more after the siskins are. I'm done with this, and so we want to be able to have all these birds go back to their natural patterns 
including the siskin, to just roam on natural food for a goodly amount of time to allow things to be cleaned and for the salmonella and the environment to lessen. It, can't, it does stay in the environment for quite a while, but that's part of that cleaning duty there. Um, and, uh, and then be able to go back to this. So, so they eat an infected bird and then next thing you know, they're sick. And our sick birds are continuing to hang out with their buddies, both of uh, their own brothers and sisters, but also of these other four-legged friends that they hang out with or our cats or our dogs. And so things then start maybe picking up some of that salmonal load, they get sick. And next thing you know, the wildlife rehabber has not just siskins, but also has a chipmunk, a Douglas squirrel or something like that, that's showing the same thing that went to the feeder. And, and you know, and so, and again, it's not bird feeding itself here. It's the fact that we're concentrating everything in one place unnaturally or in spaces, you know, uh, not just one place. You have feeders throughout your yard a lot of times, but in any case, so that's when we need to take measures. Um, as much as it pains me to not be able to see birds at feeders and, and get to see how crazy and frantic they are, um, there's also something to said about cleaning stuff and taking the time, particularly since a lot of us are at home right now, uh, to just learn about how our birds use our spaces naturally uh, without any attractants, without a supplemental feeder or even bird bath, seeing how they come through in morning and evening patterns, um, watching their foraging patterns. Uh, so for cleaning these things, uh, the best thing is to use 10% bleach. Um, obviously you wanna take these things down to an area where birds or wildlife or pets or, or kids can't get to it because bleach is toxic, but um, you know, using soap and water, taking down your feeders, using a good stiff scrub brush and uh, you know, getting them nice and clean, getting all that organic material off, then either spraying them or soaking them. I like to spray just because it uses less, but keeping them wet for 10 minutes with, like, with about 10% a solution of bleach that's one part bleach to nine parts water um, and letting that set for 10, 10 minutes. Uh, with bird baths, same thing. Um, the thing I caution people with bird baths are, you know, again, you've got some of these that are pretty heavy, so you can't move them. So spray all that water out, get it clean, brush it with a little soap and water, get it clean again. And uh, it's okay to use bleach, but you're going to want to keep animals out of it for a while. So put a tarp over it or um, a plastic bag. Uh, and, uh, you know, really after 10 minutes, really rinse that out and put the, put the bag back over it, maybe with some vent holes. I've done that, that birds can't get into, but I'd still let them air in and let it air out. And, um, and then you're good to go. So if you don't want to use uh, bleach in that, which is understandable at times, but it is, it's the best at getting those pathogens, uh, getting all the nasties, just washing it with soap and water and cleaning out real well helps too. That's just like washing our hands. So um, but that's the best thing is just getting the organic material off and then dis and then disinfecting, getting that, getting those pathogen loads down to as near zero or zero where you can using using bleach in this case. So and uh, Chris, other, Chris, oh. I'll just toss in too. Just this yeah. is this is what people should be doing year round if we're oh. bird feeding, right? Like yeah. keeping clean feeders all the time, not just because there's a disease outbreak right now. Yeah, no, very good point. No, I mean, right now we're asking folks to take down their feeders at least uh, until February, and that may change depending on what kind of reports we're getting from area rehabbers, what we're seeing, what other states are seeing. Um, and again, this is airing on the side of conservation. You may not be having siskins at your feeders. I get it. And this is not just, we're not saying siskins are the dry, the, the doomsayer of this and the driver. We're just saying they, because of their ecology and their foraging ecology and their spatial ecology, they and since we have uh, seemingly larger numbers in the United States and plausibly in Washington right now and the Northwest, uh, according to other Northwest states as well, um, you know, we have an animal that has propensity to spread this around much more quickly. So, um, so in this case, taking them down, cleaning them as I mentioned, leaving them down until February is what we recommend at this point. Uh, if not, keeping them up, but then cleaning them daily, which I mean is, pretty hard if you're feeding birds, you know, I mean, um, including hummingbird feeders. Again, this is all contact transfer. Yes, uh, these pathogens aren't real known to be a load at hummingbird feeders per the science, uh, some actually pretty recently published papers out there, uh, but they still are known to get it through contact transfer. They, you know, a sick bird lands on the hummingbird feeder or lands in a common perching place and uh, the hummingbird lands on it. 
there's been defecation there, et cetera, et cetera. Just like you and I can get it, the hummingbirds can get it too. And uh, here you have an animal that has a real high metabolism. Uh, does, it, the science shows it does not need the hummingbird feeder over the season to get through, although it's nice, it helps it. It can help certain individuals with their energetic needs and loads depending on their state of condition of their body, but it's not a population management thing. Uh, it's more of a, you know, letting us enjoy it. I have hummingbird feeders. I enjoy seeing them. I don't have them up right now, uh, but, um, but yes, they can get sick as well. And then throughout the year when we aren't concerned about salmonella, just keeping these things clean for other pathogens and just to have a clean environment, no one likes to eat off a real dirty table, for example. So, um, you know, every couple of weeks, taking the time, making sure you're just putting enough feed in that, you know, you have to add more feed daily or every other day to kind of keep that fresh. So you don't have, particularly in Western Washington, seed starting to sprout grass. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, even if the rest of it's not dirty, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you know, we're, we're wet. We got a lot of the right things here to grow turf. Uh, um, but in any case, uh, yeah. And, and so taking the same precautions, but doing it, you know, a little less drastically, you know, every couple of weeks, you know, making sure you're getting that done. If you've gone beyond a month, uh, you need to go run around the house 20, 20 times and say, I'm sorry. And, and, uh, and then go clean. Your but, penance. <laughs> uh, um, we, we all have that happen occasionally. I admit uh, that's actually one reason I took, I stopped, I stopped seed feeding about a decade ago because I couldn't stay on top of it. And that kind of correlates with me starting to have my wife and I having kids, but um, I put a suet feeder out occasionally and I put out my hummingbird feeders. Um, and uh, suet feeders usually around the holidays when I'm home and can watch them. But I can watch them. All yeah. those feeders, platform feeders, anything, anything that concentrates these birds, whether it be a feeder or another attractant that really concentrates them, that you can take down. Try to take it down as long as it's not a problem. Uh, you know, it's hard. If you can't, try to clean it. And, and even if it's something that they don't need, but you can't take it down, um, exclude the birds from it for a while. You know, if it's a feeder that's permanent or it's in a tree and you're like, I just can't take it down, I can clean it. But, but you know, you, you want to be able to do something, put something over it for a while. Put something over it for a couple of weeks. So well, that's easy enough. Um, and yeah, yeah as things progress, keep, uh, um, try not to have feeder situations where we have so much food on the ground here, you know, here, I think we have some pine gross beaks that are having a lot of fun. Uh, this is not my picture. I got it from project feeder watch, but I thought it was a great mm -hmm. picture. Great photo. Um, and I, 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 I wish I had that many pine gross beak in my yard, but that's not happening anytime soon. Uh, mm -hmm. so in any case, uh, um, yeah, so, uh, this is just something in feeder management in general, we don't want, you know, uh, that's. That's either, that's probably poop I'm thinking there. Yeah, not, now that's definitely poop. So things like this, we wanna avoid. Things like this as well. This also brings in rats, coyotes, raccoons, things that can cause problems with us. Uh, so it really behooves us to, you know, if you wanna feed some ground birds, for example, try to have a real managed situation where it feeds them and you can clean it regularly. Uh, so it's not promoting other diseases, including salmonella and just, uh, and also making those birds a, a a target on the ground too that's another thing is that you know that's baiting birds and other things like the hawks and maybe a free roaming cat can key into that and um so um that's something we all need to keep in mind another thing you can do past cleaning and also manipulation of your feeder stations spreading them farther out not having them all grouped together like that one i just showed you um using a little less seed cleaning regularly uh, also, you can alter some of them. Uh, this one, uh, the tape's starting to wear off, but this is one we used to have in one of our uh, demo groups. I went to look for it, I couldn't find it. But um, in any case, so people, they have taped uh, the seed uh, entrances. Now this one needs to be cleaned, <laughs> but uh, uh, to limit uh, the visitors to the buffet. So they basically have to take turns one at a time. So there's like one, one here, and then there's another one up on the other side. So there's no, there's very little chance these birds pooping on each other. Um, the the perches get taken off, so they can't they don't get an, animals fighting over perches. Plus, the birds tend to spend a little less time there, you know, so they they're more pleasant and take one by one turns. So stuff like this, you can play with it and see what works for your given feeder type. Uh, but uh, it's it's something I've done, something I know others have done, and it helps. So. Uh, another thing you can do to help, I mentioned, um, you know, that uh, this is something that's communicable. It can be spread to you, me, our children, uh, our pets that go outdoors, uh, particularly uh, cats that are outdoors. 
uh, the department, we recommend people keep cats indoors as do um, our partners as well, like Seattle Audubon, just because uh, the science shows that they, they, do, they do better outside of wildlife, they just do better indoors than outside fighting with other cats or maybe getting hit by cars. They, the, the data shows that they have longer lives. Um, but that aside, because we're here for wildlife, um, cats like to chase things. It's ingrained in them. They're in their minds, they're little top predators. And so they go after our birds. And I don't think anybody's going to argue that they, that they are interested in birds and go after them. Um, I'm not going to talk about population impacts or like that here, but if cats like to chase birds and other things, if that thing's sick, it can get your cat sick. And we've actually had some reports in that are suspect of cats becoming ill with salmonella since uh, this has, um, this is, since we've seen a spike in this. So, um, so it, it can happen. We've had some stuff that, you know, that some people that have reported, it sounds like it may have happened. You know, we didn't test the animal or whatnot, but um, so uh, this is why we're asking people to really watch their pets, their kids, uh, any domestic animals, your livestock around there too. We had another report where uh, apparently a rooster pecked at a dead siskin and it died <laughs> a little a while later, um, which wh what that is, we, I mean, it could be a number of things, but um, hopefully it wasn't salmonella, but it was a siskin. It was within the last two months. Uh, so, so point being, keep these animals as much as you can inside, or if you have a kitty that likes to be outside, pardon me, I'm wearing my hat, it's cold in here. Um, uh, you know, then consider like a catio like this, which is basically a little habit trail for your cat outdoors or a, a enclosed porch, uh, basically. And they can be as ornate as this, or I've even seen ones where it's just one window and one little, you know, area where they just come out onto a little ledge, you know, and, and, uh, hang out, watch those birds at the feeder around the yard. They get that, uh, mental stimulation, but they don't accidentally nab one, particularly one that may be sick and then they get sick too. So and no one wants to see that happen. So uh, let's see here. Another thing you can do is, um, you know, basically uh, start to convert your property or your spaces, like a balcony if you're in an apartment, to uh, um, to have some natural uh, habitat, natural plantings if you're on a balcony that will attract some of these animals uh, rather than feeders, and also encourage more dispersed spatial use of your environment and in the neighborhood as well, rather than these concentrated supplemental feeding stations. So here we had, still, still building it. These are years, but it can be a lifetime passion. <laughs> so, so that's amazing. These, these things progress throughout the winter. This is Russell Link. So uh, I used to work with Russ, I worked for him and uh, um, you know, uh, you should have seen the iterations before this. This took took them a long time. So, right. but in any case, I'm working on my yard. Doesn't look like this. It's getting That's awesome. It's, it's nowhere near, but I'm, we're trying. So, if if I'm not wrong, Russell was one of the people that worked with Seattle Audubon on our um, backyard uh, habitat book. That we still yeah. have a PDF of that up on our website. I should yeah. drop that into the chat. Yeah, the gardening for nature. Gardening yeah. for life. Yeah. Right. Gardening for life. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and then also, we, have a we, uh, we used to have, we have this backyard wildlife sanctuary. We renamed that to Habitat at Home. Uh, one reason being is that not, many, not everybody has a backyard. So um, uh, I haven't in the past, I do currently, but uh, although I don't look at it. Uh, <laughs> in any case, if you wanna learn more about how to provide habitat for wildlife, um, please visit our Habitat at Home website. Visit um, Audubon's web resources. Uh, we also have the Native Plant Society that has some nice web resources. If you're in King County, Washington, uh, King County itself, DNR has some nice resources on how to use native plants and to plan out native planting and on your properties. Um, another thing is we've been asking for observations. And as you saw, observations did, you know, there was a bell curve. We had observations in December before we announced this January 8th, and then it started to go up. Now we're kind of a little bit, we're still there. We still are not getting, we're still getting elevated, but it's going down. Let's hope it stays that way. But you can report what you, both you, what you see in an area of state wildlife, but also sick wildlife, which is down at the bottom of this page, can show it uh, at our website um, right here. Uh, also, another easy way is just to go to our website and go to up the top here, I can't see it because of Zoom, but there's a get involved uh, little uh, um, link there and that takes you to it. So, um, and great. that's pretty much what I've got for a 
talk today outside of I want to thank Seattle Audubon. Uh, they've got great resources. We have resources. Uh, I also want to mention that I've talked with some area rehabbers and our and our rehab coordinator, um, some of the area of Puget Sound rehabbers, and this is largely we've seen a, a lot of the stuff in Puget Sound. It started to crop up a little bit over out east with people reporting sick or dead finches. Um, we people can't test all these, so it's based kind of on clinical field signs. But but the fact they've been having concern in the north north Idaho Panhandle as well, you know, this is. We don't want it to get any worse. If it's in Puget Sound mostly right now, in Portland, in Vancouver, let's keep it that way and have that dissipate and not have it get anywhere else with some of these wide ranging species like siskin that plausibly can move on a larger landscape level. Um, and that's why we're still asking people to keep this down. And it, you know, a lot of us, myself included, I haven't had siskins in my yard since, oh, probably late December now, but I don't have feeders up either. So they just kind of, come through. I had a couple of groups go through, uh, but people are still seeing them on eBird this month, for example. And so they're still very important. They're still in the area and, you know, trying to keep the, the matchstick out is, is one thing we're asking, um, you know, and also just trying to keep your other birds, you know, uh, safe and clean and healthy and giving them some chance to get back to normal before putting a feeder back out too. So the, the, it's a sort of like, you know, with COVID-19, you know, we all were tired and like that. And you, know, you let your guard down a little bit and it's kind of like this I and mean, not as drastic of measures, you know, um, not arguably not a population effect with our birds either here, I would say, but, um, but we want to keep them healthy. Uh, we want to, we want to do the best thing. And from a conservation standpoint, this is the best thing to do right now. And the overarching body of evidence says that we've got a epizootic situation with salmonella, uh, salmonellosis and, in Washington and particularly in the urbanized areas and particularly Puget Sound. So. Great. Chris, I'm, I'm just going to recap a couple things and hit some questions from the chat that got covered, but I think some folks tuned in a little later. So we'll just kind of run through. Um, yes, we are recommending all feeders of all types be taken down temporarily. That includes hummingbird feeders, that includes suet feeders, and just using the precautionary principle that we're trying to just uh, disinvite congregate feeding for a little while. And there was some chat in there about, are we saying February or March? And I think, I think what we're saying is we're only five days from February at this point, but we're still all getting reports of sick and dead birds. So yeah. it would be, let's keep it going for now right yeah i would I, we haven't made anything formal but we've been discussing about it i hope i alluded to that in the talk yeah, but yeah we we we've been discussing extending it and i would say right. right now you know the first the first call back on january 8th we said hey you know take it down for a couple three weeks so to february mm -hmm. uh the fact that the observations that we're seeing again this is not you know we're, we have we're having to go off proxies here but the fact that rehabbers are having over tenfold of the animals still, and some of which in Puget Sound and talking with them, they're like, it's worse this month than last thus far. Um, yeah, I think we're probably looking at probably extending it sometime into February, if not to March. Right. So, and that's that's been discussed, but I, you know, I can't say for certain. That's up to our state vet and all the processes that uh, she has in determining that. Uh, but definitely something we're considering. So if the folks out in the audience are thinking about it and I would say if you're okay with it, that's the best thing to do. Right. Down. They can down until mid-February, see if their announcement comes out. Um, you know, and if you're if you're really okay with it, take them down until March then, because you know, we're gonna have things changing in March as far as our environment. So that'll also help birds spread out. Um, you know, the bummer of this is just with all of us at home, we can't see those concentrated birds. And I get it. And I took my feeders down too, and my kids are sad and I'm a little sad. <laughs> So yeah, totally feet. understand. So. I, I, I like what you said, though. It's it's relearning about how to watch what the birds are going after in your yard. And it's a real opportunity to think about what you could add permanently to your yard as as a habitat and attractants yeah. that are not feeders. Yeah, it's pretty. I mean, you know, you get keyed in on, you know, like your 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 local Buicks ran. You get keyed on, on, you know, on the mm -hmm. foraging patterns, you know, particularly during the breeding season, but in the wintering season too, you know, like, well, that bird always seems to come out just about at this time, you know, after dusk or, or I mean, after, after sunrise and, and uh, you know, and, and so that's kind of fun too. But, um, you know, you get noticing that stuff over coffee rather than, 
you know, um, having them all in just that one, uh, you know, one-stop shop grocery. We're, I mean, we're basically, we're building little groceries for these guys where we we're asking them to go back to living off the land right now. <laughs> right. There you go. Right. Right. Um, I will just note, there's a very active conversation going on about, um, the, the cleaning procedures, right? People want to know whether hydrogen peroxide is an effective uh, substitute for bleach or um, high test vinegar, uh, I know has been used in some cleaning situations. So yeah. I can appreciate that WDFW is saying the bleach solution is the key for pathogens. Bleach is the best. The yep. science is not as strong there on their stuff. You know, I think mm -hmm. that's something that, you know, I've seen that talked about my whole career here and, and prior, they've been discussing that for decades. And, um, you know, I think, I think some of the peroxide based bleaches um, are probably fine, but mm -hmm. do they do as good of a job? I can't say, and no one's come out saying they do. So it's best to stick with just your standard household bleach and 10% solution. But if you're not wanting to, some of the peroxide bleaches, they do help reduce that load from my understanding. Um, the vinegar, I'm not as familiar with that. I've looked into it. I definitely have. I've gotten mm -hmm. this question many times. I've yeah. never been able to find anything definitive. Um, I wish I could say it, but um, I mean, vinegar can help clean things. It's acidic. It can kill some things, but I think you're looking at something that's a lot less effective than even the peroxide-based bleaches, I would, I would think. But um, you know, the right. best thing, again, is your standard household bleach diluted to a 10% solution. Get a spray bottle. And even those ones that have the marks on them where you can mm -hmm. you know, one to nine, one to, those are pretty easy. You just put in one part bleach and then nine parts water up to the 10 mark. Mm -hmm. There you go. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> and as I certainly learned during COVID, uh, bleach solution does lose its effectiveness over time. Yeah. So you really only want to mix up what you're going to use in a short amount of time exactly. and then remix. Yeah. Yeah. I think the rule of thumb is, um, you know, about about two days, so yeah. a day to two days. So yeah. you're looking at after about two days, it's really gotten, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it's potentially weakened enough that it's not gonna be effective anymore. And bleach also, when it cut when it hits organic stuff, my understanding is that organics really um, reduce some of its effect, uh, efficacy as well. Uh, just mm -hmm. like, and I think that's the same thing with peroxide based stuff, hydrogen peroxide and other things. So that's one reason soap and water and cleaning them is very important too, is to get all that organic stuff off so that so the other treatment, the other cleaning treatment you're doing is being, is most effective at, at you know, lysing, getting rid of all those pathogens, so. On the hard surface, right? Hard surface. Okay, yes. that makes sense. Um, there's been a little more discussion about cleaning up the ground and ground feeding. And this is, we can speak about that. Yes, rake up uh, seed, being cautious of your own health, but is there any other treatment soaking the soil? Is there anything else people should do? No, I mean, again, uh, my understanding, salmonella can be in the environment for quite a long time, actually. This is this is more of um, reducing any load where we can. Uh, the bigger thing is not promoting unnatural concentration. So, yes, some of these birds flock together and they're concentrated together that way, which also might add to you know what some of the researchers have thought that some of these species have a propensity to have this uh, disease more often. But that aside, um, you know, whenever the, when all these animals come together, whether they're a flocking species or just a flocking species with a non-flocking species, they all can spread stuff just like mm -hmm. a kid in a kindergarten. Um, so, uh, so yeah, with the ground there, raking it up, uh, throwing away what's there because it's potentially or is contaminated, plus it's gotten wet, et cetera. Um, only putting out enough that really gets used in about a day, start to really pay attention to that too. Mm -hmm. And try to make it easier on yourself. I mean, sometimes if, uh, if you have a method that helps clean it up, you know, as far as like a, a real fine expanded mesh or something that can help you just dump and then bleach, um, you know, try that. But, you know, right now, um, you know, consider even altering those patterns. We don't, I mean, birds get concentrated in the ground too. So, I mean, as far as your ground feeding, I would, I would ask that you stay away from that just like you are with the bird feeders for a while. Mm -hmm. But once that comes back in normal bird feeding, uh, ground bird feeding management needs to be managed too, just like our bird, just like outside of a salmon, salmonella spike, salmonellosis spike. Um, you know, we have to clean our bird feeders. We, we need, need to keep those spaces around there clean so we don't get pathogen built up, whether it's salmonella or not. So, right. 
So. That totally makes sense. And just to get back to the how long question, how will people know? I'm sure WDFW will post an announcement on your Facebook page and your, your website yep. as well. We will. we will certainly try to uh, grab that and amplify it again through our social media sites. So for anyone who's watching who isn't either following WDFW or Seattle Audubon, um, PAUSE has certainly been putting out announcements about this as well. So any of those three organizations, if you follow our social media, um, that's one way to get it or website. You can also call the Seattle Audubon shop for the latest, but we're, we will follow WDFW's uh, timing and guidance on this. And we really appreciate you taking the time today. Um, I apologize if we didn't get to every single question in the chat, but I think we've covered most of it. Um, if again, if you do uh, observe sick birds, we encourage you to use that reporting page on WDFW's page. Um, and if you have questions, specific questions about feeders, feeder types, feeders that can be taken apart and cleaned easily. I saw one comment, a woman said she couldn't clean the bottom of her tube style feeder that's something to look out for. If you are looking to buy feeders, that should be one of your main criteria. How easy is it to clean? Can it be taken apart and cleaned? That counts for hummingbird feeders, that counts for seed feeders. If you cannot effectively take it apart and clean it, it's not a great product, right? Like you should really think about how you're feeding as well. So any, any closing thoughts, Chris? No, I mean, there's a whole, we can go a lot of tangents on this. So, yep. I mean, I, I've only, this is very, very quick, but I did see one question that I think is really important. That's been a common one. And that is what great. can I do with my disposed birds? Oh, great. Um, and that is uh, just to either pick them up with a double bag, you know, like a sandwich bag and another sandwich bag and, and put them in the trash uh, or you can bury them as well, but you don't want to touch them with your raw hand, you know, ungloved hands or anything like that. Um, you know, treat them like, they have a salmonella load or other pathogen, you know, and that's our recommendation for picking up dead wildlife in general, because <laughs> wildlife Great. has things. So, and, and it can be transmitted to us or our pets. So, um, so yeah, but good question, just to pick it up and put it in your trash and please use gloves. And if you can uh, bag it as well, so there's no transfer uh, or just put a bag, two bags on your hand and pick it up that way. And so. Great. Um, th there's a couple of questions about water features and things like that, mm -hmm. as far as like large ponds and cleaning. Um, you know, those are systems where they're, you know, they, they tend to, it's a good question. I don't have a definitive answer for you on that, but those systems where they have lots of water and filters, they have filtration systems and bio filtration that tends to help with these things. So I would say, you know, to ask uh, your local uh, pond specialist and, and, and also maybe try asking, you know, asking an exotic vet you know, as far as with koi or whatnot too, uh, not to my familiarity there, we're mostly talking about amphibians, reptiles, uh, I'm sorry, reptiles, uh, well, amphibians, but mammals, birds, and, and then your pet reptiles here too, so. Great. Um, and someone's just asked for the link for the WDFW page. Uh, I will, yes, we will absolutely get that into the, into the Facebook chat uh, following, following. Yeah, it's on, it's on the talk too, and I can always yeah. kind of send it to you. you know. Great. Okay, great. Chris, thank you so much again. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for jumping in with us on short notice. And uh, we will stay in touch and follow along and hope that all of our Siskins find food in the alders. Yeah, <laughs> I, I appreciate everybody. I mean, I, I, um, I love birds. That's what I specialized in before going into jack of everything, master of nothing. But, uh, and, and I, I just, I think the thing to take home here is that we all love our birds and we just don't want them to be in a situation that concentrates them where if we have a sick individual or individuals that it then becomes more of a problem locally and then in your neighborhood and then larger. So even if you're not seeing sick birds, please do the right thing and take some of these measures we're, we're asking you to take um, and, and give it more time. So and that, that allows the areas where we do still have sick birds, to, allows that to clear. And, um, and if they happen to come to your neck of the woods um, you know, then you've had things down and that promotes the clearing still, if you don't have those feeding piles basically up, you know, and I don't mean that negative, but that's basically what it is, pile feed. So, um, so I just appreciate everybody thinking about that. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. <laughs> Happy 2021. Good to see you. Thanks everyone.